discussion, but I thought it was worth bringing up. Um, I'm Becky Suarita. I'm the stewardship coordinator for the Chesapeake Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve in Maryland, uh, also a biologist at DNR. And, you know, maybe a little late in the conversation to bring it up, but I hate the term sentinel site uh, in that it is used. I hate it too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there are too many sentinel sites and everyone gets them confused in my world anyway. Um, so I would love to make it a, 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 a common practice to call it like the SAV sentinel site, never just the sentinel site mm -hmm. or something like that, because um, I don't know if it was a buzzy word or I guess because it's used so often, you would think we would have a more consistent definition, but um, I think we need to differentiate ourselves a little bit. From I thought you were going to replace sentinel. Hmm? I know. You're going to replace yeah. sentinel, not just add SAV. I thought you were Oh, well, better. I mean, I'm not right. waiting for like, 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 <laughs> long term <laughs> monitoring site, something. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, I'm trying to work it. with you. <laughs> Holly, why did you hate the term? I get hung up on the word sentinel and I just, there's a disconnect of like, well, why don't we just call it long-term monitoring program? Why do we need to use the word sentinel? So I just get confused. Like, okay, maybe sentinel means something different. So I just get into this rabbit hole of, what is sentinel? Am I doing sentinel monitoring? When it doesn't really matter. We're doing long-term monitoring and those monitoring programs have objectives. So I just, maybe it, it, like, where did the word sentinel come from? Was it a funding source that used the, the word or was it an organization or a region? Google defines Sentinel as a soldier or guard. Yeah. 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 Is that what you're going to do? I put it in in chat GPT and it says <laughs> an SAV Sentinel site might be a designated location where scientists, researchers, or environmental agencies focus on monitoring and studying some aquatic vegetation. Huh. Well, there you go. Okay. GPT for the win. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we gotta remember that's based on what people But I think if we're trying to get an idea of like what the, because we all speak the same common language, right? Yeah. That's the key thing. And I guess for me, when I think of a Sentinel site, it's a particular type of long-term monitoring, mm -hmm. right? So it's, you have your aerial surveys, you have your tier, like tier one and two, and then you get to those that's more like on the ground and Sentinel sites are, have a lot more sort of like, I don't know, maybe more physiological parameters in addition to structural parameters. And that's to me, but that's my own personal definition. So it's not helpful, but it doesn't mean that's anybody else. I think it has a good uh, consistent definition for me, but the problem I have is that I am through Siebner and various other networks, a part of, I think, four different Sentinel site programs right now mm -hmm. that each have very different purposes and meanings and everyone just calls them the Sentinel site. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And even at Malins Bay, I was chatting with someone and there was a total crossing of wires. Well, there's the a Chesapeake Bay program. Sentinel site program. There is. And, we, but then there's a whole separate Chesapeake Bay SAV Sentinel site. True. <laughs> we just need to be careful about how we're referring to it, I think. Mm -hmm. Is there some advantage to having Sentinel sites? Or site? It, it seems like we're sidestepping. Um, this is Dave Wilcox. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, but uh, um, Sentinel sites. When you select a Sentinel site, um, what we said a minute ago was it doesn't matter. Just a monitoring site that you've monitored is, is, is a Sentinel site, mm -hmm. but that seems to be sidestepping the question about selecting a Sentinel, yeah. Sentinel site mm -hmm. where there are some criteria, and one of those criteria may be if it's also being monitored for some other purpose. And so you have a ton of data for a site that may give you more information about what's going on with what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. So you're not scattering your efforts to the wind. So um, Chris Patrick, Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, I think that the question of whether we should call them sentinel sites, um, Brooke, Brooke prompted me to say this. Um, <laughs> so we, we used sentinel in a bioscience paper a few years ago because it's got two definitions. One's the guarding definition, because we were like, oh, seagrass guards water quality and provides nursery habitat. And then it's also an indicator, like in, in medical usage, it's an indicator. But you know, I think that, we could as easily just call these fixed long-term monitoring sites. And I think that's the difference between 
a quote sentinel site and just long-term monitoring because there are long-term monitoring programs which do not go to the same place every time that they're not yeah. fixed they're rotating in some kind of stratified random fashion so that's that's the the difference so uh, you know and i think that they should be in our case we're thinking about things that are going to be representative of a region and would be strategically placed in places where they're going to give us an early warning about some kinds of changes that we're concerned about, whether it's climate change or some other kind of environmental degradation. So this is Brittany Haywood, Delaware Sea Grant. So in Delaware, we don't have a lot of seagrass beds, so we're trying to study it more. So if we were to have a sentinel site, it would be an area that has historically had SAV, but doesn't currently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a completely different view, but still like you can monitor it, see if it comes mm -hmm. back. Yeah, yeah. this was like the highest potential place for recolonization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have lots of long-term monitoring sites that I would never want to make a sentinel site, like because they just they're not representative, like there's something going on there that's weird. You know, like we're watching for something completely different. But we've been monitoring those sites for a long time, but I don't think they would stand as sentinel sites. So that also is the idea of do sentinel sites, I mean, with the two definitions, like some of ours in North Carolina could be a place that is changing first and we want that to be the guarding. And then we have some that like what actually represents the system and more broadly. So mixing that up and what's the right mix has been something that we've been talking about. But I don't want to cut this short. Is there anybody on Zoom that didn't get a chance to say things? There's, a, there's somebody in the chat. In the chat. I mean, I think the goal was that we can at least speak the common language. If we agree that for this purpose in this conversation today, if we call it a fixed long-term site monitored for health, does that seem like it encapsulates whatever you're thinking about when it comes to a sentinel site? And Hey, I was just going to say that when I think of it, I do think of what um, the other person said about being fixed. So somewhere you go back to and so that you can see, you don't need, you know, you can see how it's changing over time. So the trick is to find the ones that you think are representative and then you don't know right away, you might. So even if it changes, I mean, it can still be a fixed sentinel monitoring site, my thoughts, as opposed to the, you know, random sampling. Fix being key. Fix yeah. being key. Fix. Okay. Awesome. Well, that was. I wish I thought that was going to go. So that's good. All right. So um, <laughs> we are actually right on time for the next part. So we actually have two folks, and uh, Brooke's going to take over here, but two folks who are going to give some information on existing monitoring programs. Oh, do we have a, an order, though? Who's going first? Becky? Holly. Holly. Huh. Holly. Plus dead. I say that right, Holly. How do you say it? Playstead. Playstead, play like playground. Playstead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, Holly is going to present next, and I know I am supposed to introduce you, but I don't have anything written down about your bio. So that's all right. I can <laughs> that was do my it. One job. This is <laughs> I failed. All right. Let I'm me get ahead. my. Can you hear me okay? to do your intro. Holly is. Best. Okay, that's I, fine. I can't hear what Phil's saying. That's probably a good thing, Holly. Um, <laughs> Holly's the best I've ever seen at backing up a boat trail. Oh. Um, so we went out once and she um, literally backed up this boat trail down a hill for a quarter mile, one straight shot. It was impressive. Wow. There did you hear him, Holly? Yes, and okay. he that story all the time. <laughs> we can all trailer. I make sure that everybody can trailer the boat that works with me, and it's yeah. So that I don't always have to do it. But anyway, okay. So let's see. Share screen. Here we go. All right, does that look okay? Yes, looks great. All right, and I'm loud and clear? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right, thank you, Phil, for that introduction. <laughs> I get a, I wish that there was something else that you thought I was good at, but that's not 
there are many things, Holly. I, that was just the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for inviting me to talk today about um, the work I'm involved with with the National Park Service. Um, so I work for the Northeast Coastal and Barrier Network of the National Park Service. The little map back there, if you can see that pink area is sort of the jurisdiction of um, the NCBN network, the parks that are included um, in our monitoring program. Um, so I, I just wanted to, it's probably poor form, but I'm going to start with an apology um, for my presentation. If it comes across hastily put together, it's because it is. Um, <laughs> Field work is crazy, like for everybody, and it takes precedent right now. So, you know, I'm going to do the best I can giving an overview of our seagrass monitoring program, how it was developed, how we implement it, and how we use the program and the Sentinel sites um, in the Park Service. And I know we want to focus on the Sentinel sites here, but I think it's important to describe um, our seagrass and estuarine water quality monitoring program as a whole. Um, and it includes the various scale, uh, various scales of seagrass monitoring and water quality monitoring, but I won't get hung up on details. If, if I do, just tell me to move on. I will not take offense. Okay, all right, we've... We can get into it. Okay, so the development of the Northeast and Coastal Barrier Network monitoring program, our seagrass monitoring program, was only possible because of the establishment of the National Park Service's Inventory and Monitoring Division, um, which um, was created in the early 2000s in response to the Natural Resource Challenge, which mandated that parks use sound science to make decisions. So in the early 2000s, um, the inventory and monitoring division was created and the mission of it is to implement science to better understand the condition of park ecosystems and then communicate that information to managers, scientists, and everybody who needs to be involved in making decisions about our public lands. The inventory and monitoring division is made up of 32 networks and NCBN. Um, I think you're following now, NCBN is the acronym um, for Northeast Coastal and Barrier Network, work for the government, so have to use acronyms. So it's one of the 32 networks. We have eight park units from Cape Cod to Virginia, and I've circled here the parks that have significant seagrass resources. So extensive seagrass meadows within the bounds of these parks. That's um, going north to south, Cape Cod National Seashore, Fire Island National Seashore, and Assateague Island National Seashore. Now, not part of the NCBN are Cape Hatteras and Cape Lookout, which are part of the Southeast Coast network and those parks also have extensive um, seagrass resources, um, eelgrass and paladuli and rupia. Okay. So as um, the Northeast Coastal and Barrier Network developed one overarching monitoring protocol in which seagrass sentinel sites were included for the purpose of serving as indicators of nutrient enrichment. So I just have a screenshot here of the front page of the lengthy <laughs> protocol um, that we implement that tracks but monitors trends in estuarine nutrient enrichment in the parks in all of the Northeast. 
that protocol was written by Blaine Kopp and Hillary Knuckles. I'm sure um, a lot of you are familiar with those two. And we've been implementing this protocol um, since 2006 in those, those three parks and additionally uh, three other parks. But I'm just gonna focus on the parks um, that have the seagrass um, and that would include the seagrass component of this monitoring protocol. Okay, so in addition to the estuary nutrient enrichment monitoring protocol, which is a mouthful, we implement the three -tier tiered approach to tracking change in seagrasses that was also developed by the USGS and uh, collaborators from Stony Brook and um, Park Service. So is Brad Peterson in the room? No? No. no. Okay, so Brad, what, um, this, this um, manuscript um, and study and approach to monitoring seagrass was um, tested and developed in the parks that we, that, that I mentioned in these uh, three Northeast and Coastal Barrier Network parks. Now we're, um, we're in the process of revising that um, full-blown um, protocol, the nutrient enrichment protocol, and pulling out the seagrass component into a separate standalone comprehensive seagrass monitoring protocol for the parks. So that is really taking that 2012 paper, um, integrating scales of seagrass monitoring um, and making it into a peer reviewed um, park service sanctioned protocol. The Gulf Islands network of the National Park Service implements this um, tiered approach already in those parks. So we already have a framework to work from. So getting back to the question of uh, at hand that the leaders of this group asked, how does your program use Sentinel sites? Well, we integrate them across coarser scales of seagrass monitoring and into our water quality monitoring program. So by doing this, it helps us understand seagrass status and trends at multiple scale, scales and what is potentially driving those patterns. So that holistic approach has been critical for identifying appropriate management options and research needs for the parks. Next, I'm just going to go through um, a series of maps of the three parks uh, with the Sentinel Seagrass Monitoring locations. And I'm going to show you um, just on, on a map how all of the different monitoring um, sites overlap um, and how they overlap with our water quality monitoring program as well. So starting with Cape Cod, this is a map of Cape Cod with the National Park Service boundary on in red. And you see, um, they, they might be pretty small, but um, yellow dots and teal dots, and those are our sentinel sites. So the tier two um, monitoring sites are only in one of our estuaries. And we have two tier three seagrass um, monitoring sites. And that follows, those sites follow the seagrass net methodology. Um, can you see my? Yes. My mouse? Yep. Okay. So here, here's one site um, that is representative of this open. Um, open coast, um, high energy, intertidal and subtidal, eelgrass meadow. And we have a site down here that's in a uh, coastal embayment, Pleasant Bay. And then there's a third site up here that's outside of the park boundary. And that was established um, 
last year by the Center for Coastal Studies. So we have um, three seagrass net sites out on Cape Cod and there are four in Massachusetts. And then the last thing I just wanna point out is, okay, so going down into Pleasant Bay into our um, estuarine system here, you see the tier two bay wide sample points. There's about 200 of them. They are fixed points. Um, they were randomly um, generated. Um, I'll get into that in a second, but um, they overlap with our long-term water quality monitoring program. And that's those blue hexagons. So we have full coverage of seagrass um, condition and extent, as well as water quality for that particular site. Next um, is Fire Island and same symbology here. There are about 200 tier two points um, as well here. There are two seagrass net sites, so two tier three sites, one in Great South Bay here. We've lost all of the eelgrass here. There's only rupia. Um, so initially we only had one site there. Um, and because we had we were, we're just monitoring rupia, we lost all the eelgrass. We established another site to the east in Mariches, in Mariches Bay that has a pretty stable, um, healthy eelgrass population there. So again, we have multiple tiers of seagrass and water quality monitoring at the one um, at that park. And then lastly, Assateague Island National Seashore, which um, extends from Maryland to Virginia. We only have one, um, uh, two, Seagrass monitoring tiers, the tier one, which is the um, that VIMS oversees um, and implements for the park. And I believe the park actually um, pays VIMS to do annual surveys. Um, but I think we have, yeah. <laughs> yep. And we have, we established a sample design for tier two sampling at Assateague, but it has not been implemented. So we just have the one seagrass net site there, the um, bay-wide water quality monitoring. Um, so, so that's it for um, park service work there. So just to talk a little bit more about the execution of um, the work at the Sentinel sites. So I'm calling our Sentinel sites tier two and tier three because they are fixed locations and they're representative of a location. So the tier two points, the objective is to detect change in condition on a bay-wide scale. For each of the two parks that we do this, there's about 200 locations uh, spatially balanced. I have a figure here from that Knuckles et al. 2012 paper, paper that shows the tessellated hexagonal design. Um, random points are randomly selected within those hexagons and visited every other year for Fire Island. And the same design we have at Cape Cod in that one estuary, Pleasant Bay, and those are visited every three years. And at each site, um, we make observations of percent cover, canopy height, um, and that's it. It's all done from the boat via snorkel or scuba. In our tier three, um, at all three sites, we follow the seagrass net method. So parallel, um, three transects running parallel to the shoreline. I think um, everyone is familiar with this. If you're not, we can chat about it more. Um, and they're sampled annually, not quarterly. Quarterly was not uh, logistically feasible for uh, the parks. So important um, to also talk about these things. Who does the work? It's a lot of work. So NCBN and individual park staff, universities through cooperative agreements, they're the ones that are doing the work, the field work, 
um, and the initial data collection. Um, NCBN manages the data. Cooperators assist with the with the beginnings of the data entry, and the protocol lead, which is me and our data manager, we make sure we go through the rigorous QA QC process um, that is required for um, from the inventory and monitoring division. And then we all, NCBN also does the report writing and funds all of the work. So we have dedicated funds every year that go to this. And lastly, this is my last slide, how we're use, using this monitoring data. So we're able to fulfill our mission to report stat, change in status um, or just report status of seagrass resources to the park um, and patterns. And with the water quality data, data, we can look at potential causal links between um, observed patterns and water quality and in other environmental drivers. The common methodology allows us to do regional analyses, um, which we have done. Um, the, both the tier two and tier three have been critical for informing management and identifying research needs. And lastly, um, the both of the tier two, tier three have been um, really the backbone of this um, modeling uh, that I've been doing with the USGS to this predictive modeling to forecast um, what the extent and condition of eelgrass in these parks might be given changing water temperatures. That's it. I've gone two and a half minutes over my time. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to put that together. And I know you're extremely busy, so thank you. Um, we will have time for questions. If you have them for Holly right now, please write it down. But we're going to get into the next presentation. Um, so if you wanted to do that. <laughs> so our next presentation is going to be given by Becky Swarita, who is the stewardship coordinator at the Chesapeake Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve Maryland component. Or can she back the boat trailer? She no. can. She can. <laughs> Just you wait. <laughs> I'll find some excuse. Part two of this meeting is in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a demo. <clears throat> there we go. Um, okay, thanks, Rick. Yeah, thanks. Um, so um, at the Maryland Chesapeake Bay and National Estuarine Research Reserve, we have already been doing SAB monitoring for um, long before I began at the reserve. So it's been a long time. And we are pretty excited to um, be able to hop in and coordinate with other regional efforts. So you all probably know, but just in case, I feel um, uh, you know, like I just have to do a little NERS 101, uh, which Aaron is going to really be excited about learning for the first time ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is a network of 30 reserves across the country. We are about to get number 31, which is very exciting. Um, and there's a huge amount of protected land and a shared mission of the reserves to, um, uh, research stewardship, education, and training. So it's a mission to understand estuaries, um, very valuable habitat, and share that data, conduct research, and share that with both scientific and community um, members, I guess. So in Maryland, we have three components to our Chesapeake Bay Estuary Research Reserve. We have Otter Point Creek, which is up here, um, a little bit north of Baltimore in Abington. Then we have Jug Bay. Ooh, that, that is super weird to watch the mouse on the big screen with the lag. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Jug Bay, which is on the Patuxent River, uh, fairly close to Annapolis. And then we have Manai Bay, which is all the way down in Princess Anne on the Eastern Shore. 
So we have 10,000 plus acres of protected land. We actually just expanded some of our boundaries at Jug Bay, and we are working on expanding some boundaries at Otter Point Creek if they give us the BIL money, money to do it. Um, so very exciting stuff. We have an array of different wetland habitats to look at with our long-term monitoring from freshwater tidal Otter Point Creek to the Riverine Jug Bay to a salt marsh down at Manai Bay. So our management issues that all of the reserves focus on are water quality, habitat, and climate change. So SAV is very integral to all of those guys, as I'm sure you guys know. So in addition to our swamp program, which is our system-wide monitoring program, where all of the reserves across the country conduct um, water quality monitoring through a CONMON system, as well as discrete water quality monitoring, um, we do emergent vegetation transects and we look at marsh elevation trends. We also, at the reserves where it is relevant, look at submerged aquatic vegetation over time. So uh, each of our sites that we consider, we are considering all three of our sites to be sentinel sites. Um, you can see here, these are the VIMS aerial bed outlines um, composite from 2016 to 2020. Uh, Otter Point Creek looks nice and green. Jug Bay looks nice and green. And Manai Bay has that itty bitty little spot. <laughs> so Manai Bay is an awesome system, but the waters tend to have a lot of tannins in them and which can obscure light. So there has been very little SAV mapped at Manai Bay, except for that one little spot. Uh, however, as I will talk about, um, we have been seeing more patches, uh, very small patches of SAV around Manai Bay kind of cropping up um, that are not being captured by the flyovers because they're very small at the edges of creeks, at the edges of the bay, and um, uh, mainly Rubia. Yeah, and uh, Zan. You are getting ahead of me. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> the theme for this meeting. Yeah. You're behind. I know. <laughs> so when we sat down and um, established our monitoring program, which we kind of rejiggered when I came on the scene in, um, oh, probably about five years ago, uh, which I'll talk about why in a minute, why we did a little bit of reassessment. We looked at the VIMS aerial maps, which we're very lucky and grateful to have here in Chesapeake Bay. That is not, these amazing maps aren't available all across the um, yeah, we Mid-Atlantic know. Coast. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we use these to um, look at the historic primary beds within our system to make sure that we are capturing where a lot of the SAV has always been. Um, and we, so we select an area in the middle of the bed and extend a transect perpendicular, more or less, to the shoreline, string line, so that I understand what is perpendicular to the shoreline. I totally don't go off at like a weird diagonal angle half the time. Um, so we, First, we delineate the edge of the bed, and then we estimate the distance using a rangefinder from the edge of the bed to our shoreline landmark, divide that distance by 10, and those are our 10 plots along the transect. So you can see in Jug Bay, we have a pretty broad geographic expanse from all the way up at Pigs Point all the way down to Mount Penai. We also worked to try to make sure that we were placing these transects to capture not only like the main big beds, but to make sure that we were capturing the variety of different types of SAV habitat that's available from like the big wide open um, main bay areas, as I call them, in these little sub estuaries to back in creeks that have some different um, conditions and often support different species. Can't forget Manai Bay with our little buddy here. We are just um, beginning this year to um, conduct a transect across that one consistent bed just because we want to keep tabs on what's going on in our reserves. 
But um, those purple circles are some areas that I have just from going out and about seen some rooted Xanacalia and widgeon grass, uh, rupia. So this year, one of my goals, if I have time by the end of the summer, is to um, try to get out with the drone and do some more specific mapping um, and see if it is worth starting to um, take a look at those like smaller trace fringes as well. I mean, in terms of Chesapeake Bay wide SAD resources, this is a very small amount, but we care about it because it is in the National Estuarine Research Reserve. So we have some challenges in our beautiful um, reserves where the clarity, as you can tell by this photo, is just spectacular. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> not an issue at all. So site access can be a challenge because of um, tides and shallow water and not being able to get the boat in and mud that you sink up to your waist in, um, fun things like that. <laughs> And turbidity. So if you get in the water and go to look at some of these sites, you take one step and you get a sediment plume that totally obscures your view. So there were some creative decisions made in the past for our initial SID monitoring um, before I came to the reserve to try to get around some of these challenges, but that made our methods pretty inconsistent with what else was going on in the area. So we um, made some changes to try to increase that, that consistency. So previously, we did a volumetric survey where we used a giant set of oyster tongs that give you splinters and were terrible and very heavy um, to take grab samples along transects from the boat as the boat is swinging back and forth um, and picking out the SAB and taking a volumetric measurement that we had to go through this like big conversion to try to get a comparable percent cover. So um, for both practical, because I hated doing it, and um, data sharing purposes, we have now switched to another creative solution, which involves me um, just at the height of my dignity, um, laying <laughs> on a paddleboard uh, where I am positioned over our transect by the illustrious Chris Snow, um, mm -hmm. so that I float above the sediment surface and lean over with my butt in the air and uh, put the quadrat down above the SAB to get a better visual survey. It's pretty amazing to watch, but it works. It's effective. Yeah. Um, so that is our new problem solving um, protocol that allows us to collect that consistent percent cover and condition of SAD as well as collecting habitat parameter information. So um, in terms of what we are seeing, Otter Point Creek is the clear winner these days. Over the past several years, they have been booming up there with a variety of freshwater SAD species. Of course, it is primarily hydrilla, our best friend. But um, over the past few years, I've been seeing an increasing amount of diversity, which is really exciting. So uh, we've been seeing a ton of um, coontail out there. There's a lot of, of milfoil back in the creeks, especially. I have seen multiple naiads there, including just last week um, at our SAV Watchers event. For the first time, I found northern naiad there. Very exciting. We have increasing extent of um, Valsinaria as well, which is really fun, especially in the Haha -Ha Creek area here along the edge here, which is interesting. And I think that is a result of some grasses for the masses classroom planting efforts. Amazing. It actually kind of worked as well as out here in kind of the central area. Uh, we also have curly pond weed, a little tiny bit of water star grass, and a bunch of um, Xanacalia and slender pond weed. Not quite the same story at Jug Bay. So Jug Bay peaked in its SAB coverage in 2005. Things haven't been going as well since then. Again, this is a composite map of um, bed extent. And when I first began, monitoring the, the SAD at Jug Bay in 
again, probably about five years ago. Um, there was a ton of hydrilla, a little bit of coontail, and a little bit of myriophyllum. And then occasionally, I would find a small clump of spiny naiad. For the past three years, I have found in my long-term transects almost nothing, almost nothing at all, which is, you know, a little bit of a bummer. Um, but it's clearly linked to water clarity, but I'm not clear on what has yeah. caused such a decline in water clarity. Clear on that clarity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a poet and I didn't know it. Um, but I have another little, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, another little tidbit on that in a minute. And then not to forget Manai Bay, our little buddy down here. Um, so that one small bed has been consistently widgeon grass. And then those other areas where I've seen some trace SAB has been widgeon grass and Zanichelia. And um, just this year, we found a tiny bit of Dostera, which is exciting. A, a small <laughs> amount of Dostera stored, ooh, mm -hmm. where's my mouse? Um, again, over around here, close to the boat ramp, which is like over here mm -hmm. um, at Dame's Quarter, which was very surprising to me. Mm -hmm. Again, a small amount. We have seen historically a lot mm -hmm. rafted up around mm -hmm. there, Washington, but we actually found a little bit, you know, just mm -hmm. by the boat ramp, which is kind of... What's slimy? Uh, I should be able to tell you, like 20, 15, 20-ish. So that was kind of cool. That's very cool. Yeah. So I just wanted to give a shout out um, to the other layer of, um, yay, other layer of monitoring that we are doing at the Chesapeake um, National Western Research Reserve is the SAB Watchers. Woo! So this is the CBP driven um, community science volunteer monitoring effort. Um, it's been a great way to engage with volunteers. They have been absolutely loving it when I have been running trainings and group events at Jug Bay and Outer Point Creek. We have yet to do one at Manai Bay for obvious reasons. Um, absolutely loving it. And they're always begging me for more opportunities to go out and collect more data. Um, and what's kind of cool this year, again, like I said, our Sentinel site monitoring of the long-term transect at Jug Bay came up with almost zero. We only found a little tiny bit of hydrilla and coontail underneath spatter dock, which is interesting that it's only underneath the spatter dock. But um, my group of 16 volunteers went out and they found eight whole points of additional SAV, both um, coontail, hydrilla, and spiny naiad in uh, places beyond our, locations beyond our transects, which is really cool. Again, there were very small patches, but um, a little more encouraging, especially because I prepared them all of like, <laughs> zero is an important data point too, guys. <laughs> uh, but they went out and they found that SAV. So kind of a cool success story. Um, ways that we are sharing our SAV data to let people know, again, we've got our SAV watchers story map that has been created by a Chesapeake Conservation Corps member that I will hopefully be updating soon with our new data from SAV watchers. And on the scientific side, we have the NERS CDMO or Centralized Data Management Office, where all of the NERS data, well, most of the NERS data is available for download. Sometimes you have to like request it from someone. Uh, currently, the process for submitting your SAV data to CDMO is quite arduous and difficult. So our Maryland data is not there. So contact me if you want it. <laughs> I'll also submit it to Vince. Um, but we are working as a NERS system in the NERS SAV work group to um, work on improving and synchronizing our SAV protocol and hopefully turn it into an official application module like our other Sentinel sites um, and hopefully get some funding that would support better representation of our SAV data on CDMO, making it um, cleaner and more available for other folks. Yeah, and if anyone has any questions, let me know. And I have no idea how long I talked. So hopefully we're good. <laughs> All right, thank you very much.
You're still doing it. You're still doing it. Oh, what am I doing? Discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I would like to point out that both of these presentations really very thoroughly highlighted the value of having not only Sentinel sites, but other tiers of data. And so the fact that Holly and Becky are both using tier two, tier three, you know, more broadcasts, like you were able to find SAV that we did not know was out there yeah. based on your volunteer monitoring effort, which I think is huge. Uh, so uh, a hierarchical, tiered hierarchical approach is excellent, even though today we're concentrating on Sentinel sites, but just to highlight that, you gotta have all three or it, it's ideal to have all three. <laughs> um, but so are there any any comments, any questions from the room? Anybody, anybody? The effort within NEARS to mm -hmm. put together protocols, I've heard a little bit about it through Mark. Yeah. Um, and kind of interested in how that's moving forward too. I hope that, yeah. <laughs> uh, TBH, to be honest, I kind of uh, was, not so much selected to uh, lead that effort, but like no one else would do it. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, and <laughs> so um, it is a slow process and we are currently kind of reviewing our, so currently our SAV protocol is kind of smooshed in with our emergent vegetation protocol. We are working to use a previously done um, survey and recommendations document to try to refine that protocol the journey to become an official application module mm -hmm. is probably going to be a long one mm -hmm. but in the meantime we are hoping to just improve the protocol improve our consistency and um that can hopefully be done in the next few you know next year hopefully but the application module is probably which would result in clean data hosted by cdmo that is probably going to be a multi-year endeavor if you want to come to those meetings or feel, feel free. <laughs> Do we have any more comments from folks online? Questions? Comparisons to your own efforts? Uh, I was going to make a comment following up on that, Becky. Um, I think, I mean, that's one of the massive issues right now is we have a ton of data that we've already been monitoring from Sentinel sites for years and it's just not available to anyone without them knowing about it and asking for it. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that the the near specifically are really tackling right now, but I'm sure it it happens, you know, in other agencies as well. We definitely have a data management issue with our SAV Watcher program also. That's um, the one that Becky was talking about. It's our volunteer monitoring effort and right now everybody that is involved i have never heard anybody say like i like the way this works everybody complains about our, our data management and data entry and i think i mean that would be a great place to to concentrate some efforts is getting some kind of like massive sav data portal i mean <laughs> not us but <laughs> but i mean it's very important to like make this data available, especially if it's part of like a Nestream Reserve or you know, Chesapeake Bay program. And uh, so I think that's. Have, that's have really you talked to part. like EPA? Phil, so looking at you, <laughs> about the possibility of uploading this sort of data to store it. Is there online? Does, does that so mm, that's that's like going to solve everything. Store it. Yeah. The real big problem, I think, is that it is exactly the same problem that you're working on is uh, finding a, a set of um, similar methods and and data that you're collecting. Because mm -hmm. the big uh, the big thing is that all these data sets are different, and so developing a a tool to store them is tricky if they're all different. And it's not helpful to somebody to have it essentially be a PDF. They have to go and get and like do all the damn translations yourself, and there are a couple of folks who are trying to do the crosswalk work to come up with a, a, a um, data that, a way to, to, pull, to store data so that you get the core that you can get that is um, cross-cutting. So you can identify certain things that all the data sets have and try to store those so you can pull it. And then maybe you dig deeper, deep, 
deeper. But to me, to me, what's really critical is to know that data, data exists. Yeah. yeah. And to have the location, the species, mm -hmm. and very simple data. And then something else that indicates that there's a lot more data if you want to go deeper. You know, if someone could store that, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. And for the beta course, we're willing to store. You know, the, <laughs> we want that information. Yeah. <laughs> so. You guys can make it easier to find the uh, form to submit data. Oh, yeah. You, yeah by the way. <laughs> Getting it out. <laughs> Morgan, you have your hand raised? Yeah. I just had a question. If there was any request for proposals currently um, to kind of work towards implementing a solution for the data management um, issues, or if there was any kind of documentation that shows what the data is already formatted as, um, kind of like similar schemas or anything like that that somebody could look at to try to see how they can either like extract, transform, and load into a kind of a more common database for everybody to to utilize. Are you talking about a, sit, for a particular program or um, just in general? Or just in for... just in general, but like I, I guess a, a good example would be like the SAV watchers, pro, um, watchers program. Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly when it's going to come out, but the Chesapeake Bay program um, came out EPA. No, that's oh, maybe one. No, no that's no. a different one. Um, sorry. The, yes, yeah, so we are in the process of developing an RFP to uh, further develop the SAP Watcher program coordination and data management and um, build a, like essentially a portal for the volunteers to enter the data directly into. Uh, the RFP is, it takes a long time to get one of those written and um, actually out, but I am hoping. According to the monitoring uh, folks here at the Bay Program, that it might be out by fall. So for the SAV Watcher Program, Morgan, yes. Um, but yeah, there was another RFP that came out recently for our for some um, satellite monitoring. So more broadly, there is a sort of international group, the C Grass Group, that was talking about like where to put the data, what kind of data. They had identified the OBIS database, and they worked with them. Um, Obus is mostly about biodiversity, so it was a lot of like presence, absence of the species here and there, and that was something that didn't really, you know, we don't, we need to know that as important, but also we need things like percent cover or density, or but they need to be a place for all of that. Um, so I know that group it was led by Emmett Duffy, and there was a whole data schema subgroup, um, and I'm not sure what the status of that is, but I guess we can. There's several of us in the room that were involved in that, and we can ping him on to see like what they came up with, because there's no need to reinvent that if that's going to be out soon mm -hmm. um but that one i did know that there was some it, it kind of was they were having the issue of, of how do you translate all the different forms of data and, and um and what are how you know how to put that into one database so they kind of had developed some of that but i'm not sure what the final stage is are there any other efforts anywhere else so is there anybody else online that wants to um, take advantage of asking Becky or Holly some questions or anybody else in the room? Let's say, I think from our side for the, this collaborative, just the idea, as Jesse mentioned, a table of just here are individuals that have more data. So if you wanted to go pursue a further conversation, because even from doing the survey, the fact that there was differences, it didn't even occur to me a difference if half of your quadrat is SAV, and half of that quadrat is a certain species, do you say it's 25 or 50 percent? So understanding that there's going to be those nuances and to try and cap encapsulate all of that, I think is beyond the scope of what we could attempt to accomplish, but at least we could connect individuals to say, here's it, here are data sets that you might not know even exist. And also protocols that you know, certainly if you're starting up a program and you get an idea that you're just going to develop a protocol, it'd be great if there could be some intervention and someone could just say, well, there are protocols out there, just go ahead yeah. and use them. And exactly. that way the data could be comparable instead of developing a brand new way of doing yeah. it every time. Exactly. And then maybe somebody will be inspired in the group to do a data schema. So this is the thing like the, <laughs> as the SAP collaborative, we don't have to as like have the whole group do the one thing. So if there's anybody that's sort of interested about it, like this is a great sort of you know, ping, you know, put something out, maybe we can have a place on the website. 
Uh, where someone could like uh, put something out there and sort of say like, hey, it's something I'm really interested in, I want to follow up with, and maybe something can come from that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we can be a good starting point with uh, what's available where and some protocols that are out there. And then maybe a document kind of summarizing some of that for a person setting up a, their or a group setting up their first um, monitoring program. That, that actually, you could ex not that I would make this bigger than it already is, but you could expand that beyond quote unquote sentinel sites. Yes. So, um, you know, a lot of people are doing blue carbon work, um, stuff like that, which may not fall under sentinel sites, but sharing those protocols would be really important. Mm -hmm. I just coalesced a large data set of carbon, the carbon and uh, um, no one does it exactly the same way. Yeah. Yeah. So you may be surprised by that. <laughs> so if you have that all together, we have a form on the website <laughs> where you can upload or let us know where some of that stuff is available and then we'll, we can put it on the website really easily. So if you have like a link or even somewhere. I can send you the report. Yeah, Perfect. We'll put that on. That'd be great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yes, because it is surprising how you would think something like that would be done the same way, but thank you, Phil. Or for protocols that people are using. So if you use something that's published somewhere, that's what the form is on our website. Just to, or if it's something you heard about that you don't currently use, but you know someone uses, that's new information to you. The idea is that we have, not that we're keeping up a list of resources, but that you can submit anything so that if a group is beginning their first Sentinel site, you can at least start someplace to see what other protocols are being used. But we do have, you know, we've got a page on our website that is resources right. uh, for people to, to dig through and refer to. So highly encourage people to check it out. Mainly I loaded it full of my stuff. <laughs> so it's very Chesapeake Bay heavy right now. So we would love to get some more stuff from other regions to include. That's a great point, Phil, that right now we're talking about Sentinel sites, but there's a lot of resources mm -hmm. out there that would be really helpful that we could all find in one place. So Blue Carbon would be excellent to add to that for sure. Homework. And then I know I have bugged Brooke with her development of um, some of the protocols for the Creek Watchers. I'm just looking at your pictures and I'm looking at the Park Service and I know in the coastal bays at Assateague Island, I mean, we have a lot of macroalgae mixed in and it definitely affects the health and, you know, Valleyella's whole thing about ecosystem transitions. It's not a whole lot more to put down you know, some macroalgae cover. I know you guys don't like looking at macroalgae. That's You're all SAB all people. Protocols. Mm -hmm. um, but pictures can help. But it, it could help us in looking at systems going through transition or maybe systems improving and getting out of macroalgae world and into seagrass world. It's been a thing that we've dealt with for since the 90s <laughs> in the coastal days. Yeah, I agree. It is part of the SAB watchers for sure. And the other programs like NIRS and Park Service. I mean, That's I know we work with Assateague on it a lot. There's a, in our And I saw some on your pictures. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> What's that one? Out of Point Creek. I, it's uh, very high for PC. I stole a bunch of gross pictures okay. for that, by the way. Um, Thanks for the clip. <laughs> um, in the recommendations that came out of our reserve reserve system-wide surveys, um, the macroalgae question came up and it is being considered for how we want to approach it for our revised protocol. Awesome. To set your mind at yeah. ease. <laughs> Mark service too. Holly, you had your hand up. Yeah, because I see Trevor is on here and Trevor, I think that you've incorporated macroalgae in your um, Baywide monitoring at Great Bay, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we had a, uh, a separate macroalgae uh, protocol, monitoring protocol, and we discontinued that when we started our tier two Baywide uh, monitoring and pulled it all together. So on your data sheets, when you do percent cover for canopy height, you also have the macroalgae. Yep, yeah, we do um, percent cover and uh, canopy height of the macroalgae as well. And we bring them back. And so we do for each uh, site of the tier two, we'll have four quads. Three of the four, we, we differentiate the uh, macroalgae to uh, color. And the fourth one we'll bring back and uh, classify to species. Cool. 
So when you are doing a total SAV cover, do you include macroalgae in the total? Or do you separate it out and do a total as like vascular and a total macroalgae? Are you asking me? We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll combine them. Okay. So, so yeah, included we'll, in the overall cover. Yeah. So both of them will, will total a hundred percent. Okay. So we, we do yep. macroalgae as well, but you know, one of our sites, it'll be a hundred percent macroalgae and you have to move it out of the way to look at the grass underneath. So we kind of, we have to keep it separate. It won't total a hundred. Do you encounter that? Sometimes we do. Um, I think the way we've been looking at it is that our uh, percent cover is basically how much we'll be seeing light within that that quad. So if a diver or if a pretty little beam of sunlight is coming down onto the quad, what's the percentage of it hitting? Okay. Yeah, that's a I mean, I know on the Virginia coastal, they showed like, you know, that stuff can totally make anoxic under it that mm -hmm. impacts the grasses and the recycling of nutrients. Yeah. We understand that like, if, when it's growing underneath something, like we were, we were saying, how you deal with that. It's something we, something we think about with the aerial because of course you can't see it. Yeah. Um, we hope there's not too much of that going on, yeah. but. Yeah, well, th this is within our one of our floating oyster aquaculture sites that we're looking at the grass mm -hmm. in it and the farm. And so, you know, we take drone surveys of it, but it, it, the drone images are tough because there's so much macroalgae cover. And when I move it out of the way, there's happy green grass underneath because I don't think the algae is staying there for, for very long, you know, it's moving a lot. So we, um, I don't want to discount the grass that's underneath the algae. So we, you know, take into account all of it, but it does not always, it's not going to add up to 100 a lot of the time. Yeah. Hey, Brad, do you want to talk about Florida Bay and how you all deal with macroalgae? <laughs> well, you're a more experienced uh, PBR than I am. But yeah, we do, we do uh, we treat drift algae separate from attached macroalgae. And we do total cover with drift and without drift. And then we do a total SAV, which we restrict to the seagrass species. So we do a bunch of different hierarchical totals. And then we also combine the macroalgae and the functional groups and break them out uh, <laughs> by color. And then it's a it's a very big talk about it's a lot. Burke does it very fast. <laughs> She's had a little experience on the play. A little bit. Does anyone else move? Well, in New Jersey, we have the same problem with the drift macroalgae over the seagrass. Does anyone else move it out of the way and do a separate calculation or that has the same problem? So we do both. You do both. So we're doing we're doing a much smaller study, a directed study, looking at oysters, eelgrass, um, greenhouse gas exchanges. And so we are attempting to quantify all of the vascular uh, in uh, plants, rupia as well, um, in the system, and um, in macroalgae um, separately, because we want to know what the proportions are the greenhouse gas exchange, which we're also doing a greenhouse experiment with known biomass. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a field component and a lab component. So we don't, I don't encounter that much macroalgae. I've encountered a lot of, um, you know, icky water algae, but uh, in general, our protocol for looking at percent cover is multi-layered canopy. Often it will be over a hundred percent. If you actually add up, so my total will be a hundred percent, and then my cover for each species might add up to more than a hundred because often it will be a carpet of hydrilla, and then you will see coontail or a naiad or another species above the hydrilla. Um, so we do like the multi canopy forestry approach. Um, so if I were to this freshwater algae up there. Oh uh, yeah. So I mean, it's not I usually just there. note that as like a present. I usually don't do because it's usually like an epiphyte that kind of like flaps off into a mat, if that makes sense. So that um I do quantify that a little bit differently. But were I to encounter classic macroalgae in the circumstance that you're describing, it would be 
100% macroalgae, 100% grass. Kind of the flats, because that lingia is like all over the bay, mm -hmm. the mat, and then yeah. Angela, you have your hand up. Hi, Angie Brewer, Maine DEP. Uh, we have three long-term monitoring sites in Portland and Maine. And typically we'll take a photo of our quadrat before it's disturbed essentially, and then move the kelp aside. Um, and we don't include the kelp in the uh, percent cover estimates strictly because it moves so readily with our tides. Um, so it can be within the quad, you know, in one stage of tide and then outside of it in another. Okay, yeah, cool, thank you. Yeah, that's kind of what the drift red, so like, you know, they, you were talking about like, and Aaron was talking about, all, you know, all the like in grass area kind of rolling around. And but then in the like eelgrass meadows and Chincoteague Bay, the ketomorpha is is tied in there like fish in line on a yeah, tree. I mean, it's yeah. like it's drifted through, but it's still there. And so it's kind of like, is your intent to monitor because you're using those for aerial imagery, right? Because my drone is just going to see that there's cover there. So mm -hmm. I really don't move it away because it's seeing that image and I need to know the color value to later correct for it versus the ecosystem service that I'm monitoring for where I do want to move it away. Yeah. And now I need to know, you know, shoot counts or percent cover more accurately. Okay. So this is good. I think there's some consensus on like, you know, how to deal with macroalgae. Well, it depends of course on visibility too. Like if you have a very turbid <laughs> site. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So when you're doing it with Braille. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we are just about at 315, which I think is the time we were supposed to move on to uh, discussing the results of the questionnaire. So thank you everybody for that did respond to the questionnaire and answered all of our questions. And Z is going to take it away. Can you put up the, there's a couple slides. Um, really just to go over the, some of the summary ones that I think are going to be a little bit more areas of discussion. So thank you to those that did complete the survey. It is posted. So if you click on the links underneath the agenda, you can see those individuals that completed the survey. I think that's a good reference point um, so that you know whose data actually went into the survey. Uh, and what we did learn in that this particular survey is to code it all. So the nice Google pie charts that would have been easier to visualize things, everyone does things a little bit differently. So it looked like, you know, 13 separate answers. And so the ones that we thought we'd focus on really so that as a group, there might be something that we can take out of this and find useful for our own purposes was considering which of the comparable parameters between the regions. So who's doing what and how potentially their data sets can compare. So that's again, that table even, um, distilling the information into the names and contacts information for those that have Sentinel sites. So that if you wanna set yours up in a similar way. Um, and then as a group, if it's potential for us to reach a consensus, if we think that would be helpful, for the minimal parameters. Quite a few people answered and said, we don't currently have a central site or this is what we're doing so far. Or even at this mapping workshop, a couple of people mentioned, you know, we're, we're exploring the possibility of, of establishing some sentinel sites. So the first uh, was looking both at site selection and frequency. So this one was um, organized a little bit different in that the fourth response, which was a mix of all options above, meaning that individuals um, choosing pristine locations was a factor in determining where a sentinel site would be versus being representative of different types of environments uh, versus that maybe the true sense of a sentinel, those sites that are changing in some way, shape, or form. So the majority of people were kind of within that um, realm too were just based on convenience where, where you could actually get to if you know it's adjacent to a, a boat launching point um, and then four if uh, responses to a particular group and a lot of people indicated this was funding related so if there was somebody willing to fund uh, or host that's kind of the phrase what some people use they're hosting a sentinel site um, then that drove the site selection and then out of those the frequency being that uh, majority of individuals did it at least once, whether that once per year, meaning once during peak biomass, um, or if that happened to be during a, a considered a growing season. Um, so majority of people are getting out there at least once um, during whatever they consider peak biomass. 
for the overall design for the projects, a lot of people indicated seagrass net, net so the transects that were parallel to shore. There were groups that then did perpendicular to shore and those that just did quad rats. So even within, we're calling it a sentinel site, right? So we've decided it's a fixed long-term site monitored for the health or the condition of the bed. Um, transects versus quadrats um, did vary you know, pretty consistently across all the answers that no one did one thing or one wasn't a clear winner. The size of the quadrats as well as um, the format of the data. So whether or not majority of people are using a, um, a quarter meter squared. Um, and I don't know if some of them maybe was even a typo, the point two, what is it? rounding. Um, more detail on what methods people were using, we could certainly dive into, but then how they actually recorded data. No one's doing brown bloquette. Uh, I just didn't fill out. I am. Failure. <laughs> Plus one. Well, you would be a solo there. Um, percent cover to the 5% versus shoot counts versus exact percent cover um, or percent cover to the nearest 10%. There were some individuals that wrote in only if it was rupia, then we reported a little bit more precise than not. Um, so there was some flex with that, um, but that was kind of the majority um, of individuals doing percent cover to the nearest 5%. And then the last um, kind of parameter to consider were what, or response to consider on the next slide, Jesse, uh, was looking at the top responses, 89% of people responding to canopy height, shoot density, presence, absence of reproductive shoots. And then secondarily to that, 62 to 69% of respondents put either total SAV cover, uh, epiphytic loading, indications of disease, and then cover of individual species. So that being said, those are the like these three different slides just kind of encapsulated some of the major take homes to build towards a conversation on, do we want to establish as a collaborative thoughts on minimum parameters, as well as um, how, do your, how do your Sentinel sites compare to others within this region? That's just these three. Yeah. I mean, there's more responses, obviously, the whole thing's posted, but I didn't feel like we need to go through every, every response. So then maybe you want to go back up to the site selection. We can start with just having a conversation. Site selection um, for those doing pristine versus representative, pluses and minuses. For those, I didn't really select my sites for a Sentinel site. It was kind of inherited somewhat from those that had collected data prior, prior to me, but it ended up being representative um, of two different regions uh, dominated by either just Zostra or Zostra and Rubia, as well as the level of. Um, Almost like it was designed that way. <laughs> I can almost assume that the person before me knew what she was doing. <laughs> Jesse was at Stockton before me. So. <laughs> um, so site selection, what are the thoughts on what qualities go into determining a Sentinel site? Should we interpret from this that there are no pristine sites anymore? Or people just didn't select <laughs> no. no, so this is oh, where, yeah. this was the only one that got a little confusing, right? Because we said this was an option, mix of all options above. So that then four people said it was pristine representative and locations where things to be seen to be changing. And that went into the decision. But out of all of these parameters, which would be the important ones that you would indicate to someone in the collaborative, hey, you're going to choose a new site. You've got funding to choose a new Sentinel site. Is there, is there one that would have a priority? Should, should the goal be to have more pristine sites, more that are representative? Or? I mean, I, we chose, sorry to shut up. Just, just throw this we chose ours uh, to be representative in that it's representing the different conditions existing in the reserve, not necessarily that it's like representative of a, you know, non-pristine site, if you know what I mean. Um, so within the area, there's a bunch of different species and we want to make sure we capture that. Um, and I think that that's important personally. Judd? Yeah, um, so one of the things that jumps out to me in thinking about Sentinel sites and monitoring, and uh, I, I was, I was uh, 
the, the likelihood that you're going to be sampling more intensively with finer scale at Sentinel sites is, is uh, high, highly more likely than if you were doing a broad scale monitoring where you're trying to embed a tier two program into a tier one mapping program um, or even a tier two, three, and one. So one of the problems I see is trying to resolve the bridge between um, the Sentinel sites themselves and what you might be doing at a much broader scale. So for example, here in North Carolina, we're sampling, we're monitoring twice a year about 20% about of the resource with uh, 150 stations at each point. And the, as several people in the room have had experience with the Brown Blanquet, that's the technique that we're using. You couldn't possibly do uh, shoot counts and get, the, get all that work done within the amount of time that's prescribed. So one thing that I think a question that needs to be asked is how do you bridge the center in the bigger monitoring programs in a way that the data are the data are um, comparable. Uh, I think that goes back to the point I tried to make earlier. I mean, what do you do when your biomarkers don't agree? Your, um, you know, maybe your detailed monitoring field tells you one story, but the aerial mapping tells you something differently. Um, so, I mean, I don't, I guess that's kind of wrapped into this question of site selection. Um, you know, maybe you're, maybe it's just, you're not selecting the right site, so you're not selecting a representative site um, to do your detailed monitoring. But I do think that the issue of resolving the scale um, needs to be wrapped into kind of these decisions. Well, uh, I'm going to play Chris. Patrick Bims, I'll play devil's advocate for a minute. Um, do these questions actually need to be resolved? Um, I think that one of the things that I, I look at when I see this list of questions or answers to questions is that um, everyone, while this is a collaborative, lots of different states, lots of different levels of organization from monitoring to academic to you know, NGOs um, with different resources and different goals. So it seems like a, a big ask to try to come up with like one way to do this that works for everyone. Um, in the Marine Geo uh, project development, this was one of the huge issues was trying to figure out how to do things, how to set up protocols and approaches that everybody would do the same way because not everybody had the same ability to, to do them. And um, they eventually kind of backed into a uh, methods. So trying to get promulgated methods out to everyone who was participating and then um, having basically people do like whatever, whatever ones you can do, like we'd love for you to do all of these, but whatever ones you can do, do those and at least the data is comparable, um, which is just kind of how it, how it shook out. So I don't know, there's, I just think that there's so many different right answers to these questions. Would it help to think about why you'd want to do that? Why would you want to do that? Why you'd want to collaborate in some way on no. No, yeah. picking things. You know, there, there may be, maybe that would help direct on, because of course, if you are the controller of everyone who monitors SAV, you might want to prescribe exactly how they do it. But there may be other reasons why you may want to share methods um, and of course, you, if, if you want to do research on, th on something also, you may want everyone to go grab the variables you're interested in, but maybe there are other motivating um, rationale. And if you go from that, like these are the things that we might be, the reasons we might be wanting to do this, then are there some ways to, that might um, uh, help out those that are, that could approach the possible and not get stuck on the perfect. Yeah. The, the reserves, when the discussion was about emergent vegetation, but it applies um, similarly trying to um, synchronize methods. 
we wind up coming up with the least common denominators mm -hmm. uh, document. Mm -hmm. That seems like that's kind of what we're circling here of yep. um, what's the base stuff we all do. And then everyone, if you can do shoot counts, I can't. But if you can do shoot counts, do that. If you can't do additional things, do that. Yeah. But, Does reserves have a good reason why they want to have similar? Probably. Okay. <laughs> I, just want to, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> So we're not like as the East Coast Collaborative, I think that I'll say that we're not trying to direct what people do for Sentinel Sites. We're trying to get at what people are doing. Mm. And like Becky said, mm -hmm. comment, like find out who's doing what where, see what we're doing in common. Maybe, you know, with that information in a table and a like, you know, a pie chart or eight. Uh, you know, just explain thoroughly what people are doing, the methods they're using, and then if there are things in common that we can use to compare, or if people are starting new programs, they can refer to these and maybe get on the same page, you know, as our like least most okay. common denominators. Because I think we all are going to have issues with, you know, some of us have funding, some of us don't. Like, it's really cheap to go out and, you know, swim in a straight line and write down what's there and not. That could be a central site monitoring. <laughs> you know, that could be a that's, transact. That's what ours is. Exactly. And so, you know, other groups, if they have more, you know, funding, if they have more specific questions for their region, if they want to, you know, do more detailed analyses, you know. I also think there's a biomass course. <laughs> I do think there's also a little bit of a, a timing though. Like, I don't think we, by no, I mean, I don't think it was, if there was an SAV puppet master, I would hate to meet them. Um, <laughs> but, but I do I do feel like we're, we're getting to the point where we need to do things at a bigger scale than just site by site, right? Like yes. we need to be able to compare across regions to be able to get some of these long, larger drivers of change. And it's only gonna happen through a collaborative group like this coming together mm -hmm. and saying, here's what we can share. And here's like, yeah, you know, you're saying like, let's, Here's the data that we have, like for site cover or presence absence or, you know, whatever it is, like as a group, this is where we need to do. And I think I would ultimately like to get there. I mean, that's something that I think it would be really nice um, and is needed. But you're, I think one one thing that came out of the conversation so far is the objectives are key. Like what are, and that's something that we need to really kind of highlight. Like what are the objectives of these programs? Erin has her hand up. I, I just wanted to, I appreciate Judd's comment, and I, I bring this up in discussions a lot too, of just how much easier our work is when we're not doing shoot counts and how much more you can do without the shoot count part. And so I think it's an interesting discussion to have of the benefit, like what, what benefit are you getting from these shoot counts and is it worth it? Because um, you know, I need scuba if I'm going to do shoot counts, but I don't if I'm doing cover, I can just snorkel. And that's a huge difference. Um, yes. And we take shoot counts, but we've actually never published our shoot counts. We've only published percent cover. And I know Holly, like with the seagrass and that stuff, we do shoot counts. But when we published to, when comparing sites, we only looked at cover because that was the most representative of all the sites. So I just, I appreciate that conversation and I, I think it's an interesting one to be had. It's definitely more in theme with like the different parameters that people are taking at the sites. And so for a while I was doing epiphytic coverage, collecting the shoots, scraping, measuring, things like that, but there's not a great model that indicates there's a relationship at all between the little water quality data I have with what that epiphytic coverage looks like. So the amount of time that it would take to do all of those wasn't really worth it. And so I cut that out, which allowed me to expand and do more sites during a biennial monitoring. So I think having that in mind, shoot counts are a beast, absolutely. So if you're not using the data points in any way, shape or form, if you don't have a good model that indicates at a certain density of shoot count, it means your system is likely to crash. You know, If you can't model it in some way that you're getting viable data out for your managers, for you know, a study on resilience, whatever that purpose is, and why continue to take those data points? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that shoot counts, the, the place where I think that information is most useful is if you're thinking about surface area and habitat for really small epifauna, like really dense rupia is better for zoe crab, uh, sorry, I'm 
it was a long day. Um, blue crab um, in star settlement. You know what I mean? Like they're, you're going to get more higher densities of these small things and, and high density shoot counts. But um, I mean, I, I, I think that if you've got percent cover and you know what the morphology of the plant that you're looking at is, you can kind of back into that to some extent. It's not yeah, perfect. But especially if you have cover and canopy height, right? Right. Okay. I mean, I'm going to push back. Oh, okay. <laughs> Being a scuba guy in particular. Um, <laughs> So I think it all depends on what question you're asking, obviously. Oh, yeah, definitely. Right. And, and so we do a lot of shoot counts. Um, and we do a lot of leaf area index that we talked about for the last two days. Um, and we do a lot of carbon work. Um, but we also use it for to generate biomass estimates. Mm -hmm. um, so as opposed to um, doing destructive sampling for your entire quadrat, we'll do a shoot density count and we'll take a representative shoot or two from the quadrat and extrapolate up to get biomass. Mm -hmm. And I do think we found in some of our systems, biomass is a really good predictor of change. Mm -hmm. um, the metals will thin out before they you know, completely uh, disappear. So um, I do think there's value in it um, from that perspective. But can, can that be, um, if you did a, a bunch of it, for a year or two, I mean, could you uh, develop um, basically relationships? That well, I've been, to skip I've been, I have to admit, I've been thinking about developing a relationship between shoot density and percent cover. Yeah, um, I mean, we can uh, Ken Moore did that for us back in like I think it was like the eighties, nineties, nineties. Yeah, it was like early nineties, and and the whole purpose was trying to relate it back to the aerial cover, and you know those relationships don't really change. So once you take the time to get a, a couple hundred you know, observations and kind of build the empirical models. They, uh, I think you can then kind of kind of roll with that unless you get a really specific need mm -hmm. to go back and get more in situ counts. That Holly said her hand up for a bit. Yeah, a couple comments on this uh, this issue. So, with the Aaron, you'll remember this. I think when we were analyzing the seagrass net data, we wanted to use shoot density or biomass. Um, and we settled on percent cover because it was the most consistent across all the sites. Um, and there was an issue, there's a observer bias that comes with percent cover that you don't really have with shoot counts. Um, you know, depending on how you assess percent cover, if you do it the easiest way, you just look down and you estimate percent cover and you have some sort of a guide to say, okay, this is 25, this is 50, but there's always going to be some observer bias. Um, I've in, when the park service protocol was reviewed, um, we got a lot of, um, I don't know, I'm not, not complaints. I just can't think of a better word than complaint. So I'm just gonna say complaint about um, percent cover measurements, not using a more objective approach, like taking a photograph and then putting that into a system and doing sort of like a point count, point intercept um, in a computer system. You know, that's just not feasible. So I just, if, those things just need to be considered at the front end when you're deciding, okay, what parameters are we going to measure? What are we losing? Um, how are we going to account for um, uncertainty and differences in surveyors? And then the other thing that, let's see, shoot density and percent cover, um, the relationship, generating relationships between shoot density and percent cover. Those obviously are going to be um, depth dependent. So a percent cover on in a deep site might be 100%, um, but the shoot, Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, her hand yeah. does this a lot. <laughs> the cape it doesn't have great Wi-Fi well, I, I think that relationship is also very seasonally dependent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's also like, 
for those who do a lot of shoot counts, um, you go to a quad right, you get your percent cover. Um, do you always just go to like the lower left corner or like, because when you've got patchy distributions within your quadrats, like where you choose to drop that smaller subsample really influences the count. So, I mean, is there a consistent way that people are dealing with that? We do it. The, the NEAR program does it with, with, well, at least we do. I don't know about NEAR why, but max it's maximum density. So it's in the densest part of the quadra, but the seagrass net protocol is, is different. It's representative. So yeah, I mean, that's another parameter that just changes <laughs> depending on what program you're monitoring for. So I will say that Aussies have done this for a while, the whole like take a picture and then use that as a relationship for biomass, micro sheets group at JCU. This is what they do because they fly from helicopters, right? So they can't get in the water. So they, um, they'll take a quad, they drop it over the side, somebody, the observer made the percent that cover estimate, they will then take calibration quads and they will dig up an entire quad, process it for biomass, get shoot density, all that sort of thing. Everybody is an observer. When you get back from observing, you have to go through a set of, there's like, pre, like the ones that are calibrated, you have to go through and you have to rank them for species, total cover, and then you then score yourself on like how, if you were above or below the regression line, and then they adjust your measurements based on that. Um, I will say that relationship is tight in the middle. It's crap at the end. And this is after like 10 years of quad data. Um, and so like they, it's, it's supposed to be the best way to get sort of mix of everything. Um, and that's, I mean, that's pretty rigorous. Um, and there's a lot of shame when you don't do well on the test. <laughs> so, but they, it's, it does kind of get around that sort of observer bias, but it, you know, again, it's not perfect, right? It's good, but it's not perfect. Versus Bron Lepay, where the bins are so large, it's yeah. much easier to train a bunch of people in a much faster way. And that's honestly why we did that in North Carolina because we the it's all volunteer based. Um, and so even within DMF, it's like if they have a time to go out, like they'll go. But it's the it's a NEP leading it, and anybody whose time goes, and we have to do like trainings. And so um, the Bron Lepay, which has been pretty effective in Florida, um, is way brought it up to North Carolina. But that, but those are not Sentinel sites. These are uh, tier two. randomly spaced, spatially balanced samples that are over a, a large area. So that's, that's the big difference there. Mm -hmm. sure. I just want to mention, um, I know, I think Chris mentioned it, but Dr. Kenmore did develop a biomass relationship to estimate biomass based on cover and shoot height. So it doesn't use shoot counts at all. I think that's species specific though. Yeah. Like that's going to be super different for the freshwater species. Yeah, and the report yeah. that we actually, it was for species communities that we, that we put it together. We were, we were yeah. trying to get a biomass estimate for the entire bay. Yeah. Um, um, a lot of species. Patty Delgado, who was doing the Tong volumetric surveys that I showed pictures of um, for a long time, she like developed a, a curve of volume to biomass sample. I also forgot to mention in my thing that we take one biomass sample per transect. Um, but I was trying to tinker with her data a little bit to try to basically find a conversion factor from our new you know, from percent cover back for hers, but I, I am not at all confident in the ability to make them talk to each other. But I think that it would be a great PhD project for someone that the collaborative could fund to take Just all of our <laughs> <laughs> take all of our We're data not data <laughs> and money. create conversion factors for species for community. Does that make sense? Right. Marie Dunn, get money to find Get money. <laughs> Easy. Check it off the list. Cheers. She's going to put that into the years, probably. <laughs> <laughs> We're funny. Yeah. Science collaborative right there. Yep. Beautiful. Aaron, let's get on it. Uh, I was surprised. I mean, looking at the slide, that biomass was not one of the top yeah. parameters you know, measured. Um, I mean, canopy height is nice, but it doesn't really mean a lot to me. Um, so I don't know if people have thoughts on why it's not there. 
It's hard to do. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah, they were hard. I mean, I do biomass as well as percent cover, but I've only got two sites. Yeah. Maybe some people were concerned about taking lots of biomass cores mm -hmm. at their central site. Um, so change it all in sound over time. Yep. Yeah, I guess if you, oh, took, yeah, yeah. if you took too many. Um, I mean, we've got, for our sentinel sites, um, we've got fixed quadrats that they're, you know, spatially fixed and we, we're within a meter of each of, of that spot every year. So if we start plugging mm -hmm. holes in it every year, um, there won't be anything left after a couple of years. Yeah. I always make myself feel better about not taking biomass cores when I say, I do not want to do destructive sampling. Yeah. I just, I can't destroy the sequence. And yeah, hi. I was just wondering um, what you thought about one thing I used to do as sort of a compromise from doing percent cover with from Blaquette, but just um, or, or doing shoe counts is sort of in between and just um, take your quadrat and, you know, do the strings on it and then you count, um, you put it down and you count how many of the squares have SAB within it. So it is percent cover but it's more quantified than just kind of guessing, you know? And I think that's the method that's used in our low salinity protocol now, because you often can't see it, but you can go down there and you can, you can feel, you can feel it more than you can see it. I don't know if that would be like a little more quantitative or, or not. That's written into an old protocol in New Jersey to do the grid of 16 and then you count the number of cells that have mm -hmm. SAB. Uh, the problem is just how to statistically analyze that and compare across different sites. There's not as many people using that method and it's really only good if you've got someone that's taking that the data in the same way. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't get to me, it doesn't get at the question of, well, one shoot still fills that cell. So I could, conceivably not change values over 10 years, but have a significant decline in the bed. So it wasn't really showing me what I could see was happening in my system. So I-, I Yeah, right, really I see that, I do, I get that. But you could also have that inconsistency with the Grand K too, so. Yeah. Sure. Practice, practice. Yeah, <laughs> I did look up the survey to see, but biomass, as far as, we didn't include that as one of the items to check off. Check all SAV parameters that are measured, recorded as part of SAV Cinema Site Monitoring Protocol. That was the question on the survey. And we didn't have biomass. It was, we had a write-in for all of them. Uh, we had a write-in for all of them. No one wrote it in. <laughs> but there could have been sampling bias and that, you know, no one wanted to write things. You could check things off. <laughs> People wrote in a lot of stuff. That was part of the coding mm -hmm. issue later. But. Rapid assessment. Other thoughts on parameters, because we're kind of on this section here. I, I think to Jesse's point is if we can't compare across our, even within our collaborative here, um, how helpful are Sentinel sites outside of what you're doing for that distinct purpose? And if it means that it, it lives within your state or your region um, and is beneficial only to you, is that serving the larger seagrass community as a whole when you can't then contribute to larger databases? Well, did, I mean, is anyone here part of the Zen network? Part of that? I mean, how, I mean, that's essentially what we're trying to do here, right? How, how well did that work? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> How many papers came out? Well, yeah, that's one metric. Yeah. Um, and listening to people at the bar last night, there wasn't always agreement on those papers, but um, which is not surprising when you get more than 10 scientists in a room together. But, mm -hmm. but I don't know. Is that, I mean, I mean, that's a model. I mean, is that, did that produce what we want? It, you know, our outcome to be. Well, Zen was very much an experimental kind of network, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. but everyone, I mean, everyone was doing identical yeah. 
methodology in multiple locations. Um, and then, um, you know, they're trying to draw, you know, larger scale conclusions from that. The one, I mean, the one thing, I've, I have read some of their papers in the past, and one thing that really irked me was um, they took 25 centimeter sediment cores from blue carbon and they presented their data as a meter deep. Um, and they just multiplied by four and assumed that everything was the same. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, that number is always it's kind of <laughs> sketchy, but um, that is, yeah. Um, but, um, but I mean, the concept of everyone following the same, you know, protocols, I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about here. Uh, I, tell a bigger I, story. I think I, one of the big differences. So like I, I wasn't part of Zen, but I'm, I'm hip, I, I drank the Kool-Aid on Marine Geo, which is basically like Zen Plus, um, and like Emmett's running that. And I think that for that network kind of approach, it's all about uh, conceptual questions. So it's like very like question-oriented science. And um, and I I think that the questions we're interested in aren't necessarily process-based, but thinking about what's what's the state of seagrass. On, on the East Coast, is that is that a, a good sort of summary of what we're talking about, or am I totally off base? I think it is, and uh, Aaron can correct me, but like, so not correct me, but comment also in the reserve system. It, we kind of struggle a little bit when we think about what we want to be spending our um, resources on, and you know our, our time and capacity, because we're always like, and how to analyze our data in some ways, because it's like. Well, what what are what's the goal? Like, what's the question we're trying to answer? And while we have some questions with all of our long-term monitoring and specifically some of our research projects, the point is to generate data for people to do with as what do what they want with. Um, and the point is to generate the data that can be as useful to as many people as possible and be representative of what's the state. How can teachers? How can other researchers? grab this data and answer other questions with it. So we want it to be broad and um, applicable to a lot of different things instead of only specifically to answer one question, which can be really difficult to wrap your brain around for yeah. me anyway. So I guess what where I'm getting stuck with this is that when, if, if, if the goal was like, let's say we were the federal government and we were going to do, we we're designing. Some of us are the federal government. Yeah, some of us are. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll, just pretend. So we're all, we're, saying, we're all the federal government. And uh, I mean, let's say the EPA wanted to do a seagrass specific coastal condition assessment, kind of like okay. the other. We're actually going to be doing that. Right. Yeah, so so you, you, you design a spatially balanced uh, like survey design and like a priori select all the sites based on representative representative locations and density of sampling relative to the seagrass and like that would work really well there's lots of states that have done that for things like stream assessment um but since but we're kind of more of a loose collaborative group and um like we're not doing a top-down approach so if we just if everyone did what the low-hanging fruit was or their relative um, interests were and then you tried to use those sites to um represent the state of seagrass there's going to be lots of biases and, and it wouldn't necessarily be representative. I, I think that's where I'm getting stuck. Uh, well, I mean, I could tell you right now what the state of seagrass is without doing any monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I guess I think that the strength of this is, I mean, we all, where's, where's uh, Brad? Who's for hot water over here? Um, <laughs> um, we're all concerned with climate change in these larger scale processes. And, just having us look in our own little backyard is not going to tell us much about that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think that's the strength of expanding our view here. Um, and, um, you know, if, if we just wanted to do the state of seagrass, we could just do tier one monitoring, bring those maps together and say it's declining fast, faster here, fast is here, and it's gone here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's not going to, we already we kind of already know that. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, would one of the things that would uh, could be cu uh, accumulated is you know, you're pulling this kind of collaborative information together about what we're all doing, and but one of those pieces of information that could be shared by a smaller group would be if we had this sort of information that everyone was producing, we could possibly do X. 
that we can't do if we just all do the independent, totally separate things. But in other words, if, if there was a, if someone put the mental energy into figuring out that there is a particular question that could be addressed by these pieces of information and put that out there, maybe that would be a, a th this would be a group that could help elevate that a little bit so that others who were interested in maybe answering that question might help ring the bell and say, could everyone do it? <laughs> well, so here's a very concrete example. And I know this is something that Jesse is, is already acting on, something I've thought about, um, the concept of assisted migration, um, moving mm -hmm. seeds from south to north. And as part of that in the Northeast, um, courtesy of discussions with Bob Orth, mm -hmm. um, we are trying to generate the really basic information you need to make something like that happen on scale, which is what meadows flower at the highest rate, when do the seeds mature? Um, and so we have people now going out, multiple groups from New York to Maine, mm -hmm. um, collecting that type of, or starting to collect that type of information. And we have some of the estuary programs putting on RFPs to do that basic data collection. Um, and that's a very directed, you know, here's, here's what we want. Here's, and we've put uh, protocols on how to do it. And, and so anyone, uh, you know, person off the street, you don't have to be a PhD scientist to collect this data. Um, and we'll see what happens. But, you know, I, I would love if that could expand further south uh, too. I think it'd be a nice study to look at just the flowering phenology over the entire latitudinal gradient, gradient for Zostra. Um, and how it's changing. changing. Yes, how that's we've changing, been, yes. We've been collating that for our, our little area, we're trying to build like a 20 year record because we have it all in notebooks and it never got yeah, everyone done. So we're, <laughs> we're working on that and definitely, I mean, I'm sure everyone's seeing the same thing. It's moving, moving earlier and earlier. I'm, hands going the wrong way. Yeah. Judge, your hands up. Yeah, before I leave to put a little, uh, comic uh, aspect on this. I think, Jesse, you and I need, and Ann, we need to invite Phil down to North Carolina to count all the hella dooley shoots in our yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. First you get to tell it apart. We, we get, hey, Phil, we get yeah. 10,000 shoots per square meter, so, you know, we'll have to put you up in a... I'm on it. I'm on it. hospital or somewhere <laughs> so you can... Finish, finish a quadrat a week. We'll get him his tank. He likes to be on surface. <laughs> I'm just joking, but I. But... Yeah. So we have about five minutes left um, in the meeting today, and um, I do think there's lots of obviously great ideas in discussion, but I, I think that we have enough to kind of start putting a little bit of a summary stuff together. So what we're hoping to do is. Um, using the steering committee, thank you steering committee members, uh, to what we'll put out sort of a draft document and then send that around the steering committee about sort of summarizing some of the key points of this and then maybe next steps. Um, definitely getting that information for the table and um, they can then send that out to everybody else in the state so everybody gets a chance to look at it and see add any comments or like, I really think this needs to be or added or taken away or something. Um, and they were hoping to have that by the next meeting. Um, to everybody as sort of like a, at least have that table, if nothing else, um, so we can have something to build off of. Um, and I think we're also gonna meet with the steering committee between now and then to figure out the topic for the next one. The next three highest that got votes from our kickoff meeting were for mitigation, living shorelines, or restoration. Just to put that out there. So during kickoff meeting, we had the sticky notes and people voted based on the topics of interest. Definition of the meadow. I add and add a note on that too. Yeah. Um, so if you have strong feelings about it, please email your steering committee representative and tell them please that you would like to look into that. And if you're not sure who that is, you can go to the website and uh, they're listed there. Can I just bring one thing up? Like you yeah. talked about the collaborative or the purpose, and I think you mentioned the federal people trying to do the SAV. I know National Coastal Assessment is looking to add SAV in. They're not going to scuba dive and do shoe counts. Um, you know, they do a lot per site, and maybe it's not what you guys want, but it would be good if the collaborative, if there were certain things that they would like to recommend, now is the time they're looking for recommendations on that and how to add that in for the 2025 circle. Who should we spam? 
Pardon? I said, who, who should we spam with emails? With recommendations? <laughs> I mean, I sit on their steering committee. I can bring forward ideas, or if you want to, I mean, Hugh Sullivan's the main contact at headquarters who oversees it, but I oversee it for Maryland. Um, it used to be Don Cosden down in Virginia. I'm not sure who's the Virginia contact for NCA right now. I don't know. Great, that's, a, that's an excellent idea. We could definitely mm -hmm. um, use it ways to kind of summarize. It's a good way to think about it. Like what we want to add to a national so, Thank you. Yeah. Good idea. But I think our next meeting might be yes. Is that what we just we yeah. talked about? We kind of talked about if our next meeting could be a hybrid again at SURF for those that might be in attendance. Anybody planning on going to SURF? <laughs> right, we'll definitely follow with everybody with more concrete details on that. So um, if there's any, nothing else, just thank you guys so much for coming and putting your time into this and, and, and awesome conversations. Is, that a, uh, is your hand still up or is that a legacy hand? No, that was a question I wanted to ask Elizabeth. I can't see her. Uh, oh. Screen, but I, yeah, we're all over here. <laughs> uh, do you have Sentinel sites in Barnegat Bay, Elizabeth? I do, yes. Okay, I'll follow up with some other questions on that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. We're already working. Look at this collaborative party already. <laughs> <laughs> and anything else you'd like to see out of the collaborative? I think that was one of the goals for Brooke and Jesse and I when we started this, is that we want it to be of use, not just another meeting where you go and you feel like you're not getting anything out of it. So if there's anything that you didn't get from today's meeting, uh, uh, email broke now. <laughs> the East Coast SAV Collaborative email goes to all three of us. Um, so any suggestions you have for things that would be helpful as you're tackling anything within your home state or that anyone brings to you as a steering committee member, just let us know so that we can make this as useful as possible rather than another obligation that you stop coming to. <laughs> Swag. Swag. I don't got the logo. There's the logo. The logo nice is shirts. Yeah, great. And we have, we have two versions of the logo. Yeah, so, <laughs> we failed to actually like launch the logo. Just, this was the soft launch. It was, oh, it's on the PowerPoint. That I yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know where I put them. Sure. It'll be on our website soon. I shut, I shut down Chrome. I was done. I shut it down. Get me out of here. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank That'd be cool. You can, I tried that. 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 I no, you voted no introduction. No, that's not yeah. it. I don't think it's what that is. I don't know what else to say. I think it's his contact in the chat. Well, not the room. That was at the end of the meeting, so I don't think it was like intro. You did it. It was like about something specific. I did write down everybody. I'm trying. What was the comment? Can you put a contact in the chat for people not in the room? Uh, that would have been like maybe for the EP. Yeah. Yeah. 357. That was yeah. right. Nobody else had. Yeah. 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 Figure out what. Where the only other email address? Maybe. We'll put that. We'll read something. Like,